Today I want to talk about this topic. Um, I have not really finalized the topic, but as increasingly as I find that the world, how many of you find there's an increase in various kind of teaching in the social media these days? Yes, anybody find there's more and more teaching, all kind of different, different kind of teaching. Today, more than any time. In those days, you know, it's very difficult to find. If you want to get a hold of a, a speaker, you have to find the VHS, you know, the old school <laughs> video, you know, that, that thing they call VHS. And then you have to go and, you know, wait for months to order. You know, I still remember years ago when somebody said, wow, they have Catherine Kuhlman's video. Wow, we were so excited. Catherine Kuhlman was a lady that the Lord used powerfully in the 60s and 70s in America. You know, for in, in, in the, in the, in the so-called the revival of healing and deliverance. So during that time when they say they have Catherine Kuhlman's video, wow, we were all so excited. And I remember placing the order for that particular video and it was in black and white, you know. And then putting in the VHS, wow, you know, you're so amazed about how God used this powerful woman. Yeah, amazing lady that's used by the Lord. But today, if you go to YouTube anytime, or TikTok, anytime, Facebook, you can find any kind of teaching. So now it means that it's increasingly, uh, there are more things that's available for us, the believer, the body of Christ, than any time. Now what does that mean? That means we need to know what is good and what's no good. Because if you are eating from the wrong source without knowing, then you're eating the wrong food. When you eat the wrong food, you know, you can, it can affect your body. When you eat the wrong spiritual food, it can affect your, yourself spiritually also. So I'm going to begin with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. I'm going to start with this premise today with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. This is where Paul tells the church in Corinth. He said, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. He said, For I have betrothed you, the church, to one husband, Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Wow, yeah. To present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That means the church is supposed to be presented as a chaste virgin. How is that so? Because we are washed by the blood of Jesus. When we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, God can present us as a chaste virgin to Christ. He said, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. The area that the enemy works in us is our mind. That your minds will be corrupted. That means there are all kinds of teaching today that can come to uh, uh, inform us, that come sometimes for us to, to receive without really knowing. Because if I can guarantee you, if you don't know the Word of God well, 80% of the teaching you can't tell whether it's legitimate or not legitimate. You can't tell because you cannot measure against the Word of God. That means unless I have a machine that can detect the real bill, if it's counterfeit bill, you can't tell. Today, the, the counterfeiter has done such a good job that if there's a counterfeit bill floating around, it looks so real. Unless we have the machine that scan, right? That detect all the watermarks or other stuff. Otherwise, we can't tell whether this is a legit or not legit bill. Likewise, the only way you can tell whether this teaching is legit or otherwise is only when you have the Word of God actually firmly planted in us. And only we have the Word of God with the right understanding. Because sometimes you have the Word of God, but wrong understanding also is useless. So it's so important, but here it gives us a guide. Paul said that he desired to present the church as a chaste virgin. Guys, therein lies a very important, uh, 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 what I call, uh, not signage, but a very important, uh, what's the word for it there? Eh? Important, why well, suddenly I lost my word. <laughs> it's a very important reference point that what God is desire of the church. That I means one of the things that today there are so many emphasis in different kind of teaching, right? You have got the churches, sometimes they specialize just on the supernatural. You have churches who just specialize in casting out demons, and then you got churches who just specialize in healing, then you got churches who specialize in just prophetic. Then you got churches who specialize just in the you know uh, uh, supernatural, the, the our body experience, you know, oh, you know, they've been to heaven and stuff like that. So there are churches who totally don't teach about the supernatural. There are churches who believe that today the Holy Spirit has ceased. You know, the cessationists believe after the book of Acts, Holy Spirit closed shop. You know, there's no speaking of tongues, there's the tongues of the devil. So you have got a plethora of different kind of teaching. 
and what is right and what is wrong. And then the teachers today will tell you about prosperity, that, you know, there's only prosperity, that every, every service you go is about prosperity, that God wants to bless you, you know, God wants to make you rich, you know, and then the church will tell you, oh, God loves you just the way you are, you don't have to change anything, you know. So, so what then is then, what should we then focus? So, so if there are so many emphases, then should we be a church that's prophetic? Should we be a church that only teaches the supernatural? Should we be a church that only talks about healing and deliverance? Or should we be a church that teaches about the Word of God? What should be the church? And if you want to know, I always said as last week, if you want to know how should the church be, how does God gauge us, they are all what I call signs, reference point, that is littered in the Bible. So Paul say that I am jealous with you with the godly jealousy. Why? Because I betrothed you, the church, to one husband, Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin. That means purity, sanctification is one of the most important things. That means one of the things that you should, every day we should be preparing is in the area of purity. That means in the area of being sanctified by the Word of God. How do we mean by purity? A lot of people, when they talk about purity, means don't sin. <laughs> Right? Well, this is a very old school thinking. Uh, it's a very, very, what I call very elementary thinking. We should get over that no sin thing. Yeah, later we talk about how then we present ourselves as a chaste virgin. Is it why? Because there's a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. That means Satan did not deceive Adam and Eve by his power. No, he deceived them by his craftiness. It is not wow, the cosmic struggle, you know, the wow, what you see in a movie. No, it's just through craftiness. That means Satan will wriggle into your mind to deceive us. And then, therefore, since the battlefield is at the mind, that means you have to protect your mind. That's why understanding and wisdom is so important. Because without the right understanding, you'll be deceived without even knowing you're deceived. Lorna, you look so excited. I should take a picture of you. She can hold that posture for the whole service. <laughs> yeah. so, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. There is a simplicity that's in Christ. That means, that means actually, at the end of the day, listen to this. That means at the end of the day, the message of the gospel and the preparation should be actually in simplicity, not in complication. Then when it gets complicated, you have to be careful. When, 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 when people present the gospel and make it well, all kind of what I call spiritual calisthenic, you've got to be careful. That's what I said last week. Today, not too long ago, I read about this, I mean, I heard about this particular preacher who, who is a regular, guys, a regular guest to the courts of heaven. You know, he traveled to the courts of heaven, do some negotiation with Jesus, you know, and then come back to earth again, you know. And so I used to be very impressed with such spiritual people. I said, wow, you know, they can actually, you know, bring themselves, teleport themselves in the spirit to the courts of heaven. Is it true? Quite frankly, I don't know. But what I know is that there is no such emphasis in the scripture. That means if we look at the Bible, what God is looking at is I present you as a chaste virgin, not a supernatural virgin. <laughs> yeah. If the Lord like Paul, was brought up to the third heaven and he come back with revelation. Praise the Lord. We need that. That means once in a while, I believe the Lord will choose certain individual and then reveal to them certain things that he may send this as a warning, as edification to the church. We praise the Lord for a genuine and authentic encounter like this. I believe there is a place for that. Where either people are brought up to heaven or sometimes they are brought to hell. Right? And then they describe to you how hell is like. It's, it's a terrible place. Right? And so therefore, I believe there are people who have, you know, uh, the same people who believe that they can be taken out of heaven. Nobody ever said, I want to be swallowed by a whale for three days. And so they want to experience the power of God. People never say that. How come? That's also supernatural, right? How come you desire to go to heaven? How come you don't desire to be swallowed by a whale for three days and three nights? Because there, I believe there are certain things that happen for us to instruct us, but it should not become a regular thing. This is my belief. I stand corrected. Yeah, because I tell you, the things of God is so deep, so wide, so high, and so far, that none of us can say we fully understand everything. 
Impossible. Not myself. I consider myself any less than one percent of the kingdom of God. So we are all growing. I can tell you something. Maybe at 70 years old, I can repent for what I just said. Maybe at age 70, I say, no, guys, what? What I told you the last 10 years, I'm wrong. <laughs> Actually, it is possible that we go to heaven. You know? And it is the will of God that every one of us go and encounter heaven. Okay, maybe over the years, if I grow and the Lord prove and show me that I'm wrong, I will repent. Yeah, and then in case you do not know, there are some churches right now that talks about immortality. Oh yes, yeah, they talk about immortality. I look in the Bible, right? The concept is that they believe that we have eternal life in us. If we have eternal life in us, then we should have immortality. Now, is it right or wrong? Well, quite frankly, I also do not know. But one thing I know that the immortality is not emphasized in the Bible. You know why? Because immortality, I know when Jesus comes back, mortality will put on immortality. Amen. That means during that time, there is a time when Jesus comes back in Corinthians chapter 15. He said, on that day, mortality will put on immortality, corruptible will put on incorruptible. That means there is a time for immortality. But I also believe that there are sometimes God will appoint certain people in the body of Christ to be a forerunner. Amen? That means they are a forerunner of what things to come. But does it mean everybody should also be taken out to the third heaven like Paul? Not necessarily. Sometimes this is shown to tell the people, the body of Christ, that these are the possibility. That when Paul went up to the third heaven, he said, I hear things that are inexpressible and that I can't even lawful for me to even share. But the trip that Paul took to the third heaven was a tremendous trip because it helped the church. He helped him to understand certain mystery and revelation. Yeah, in case you're thinking where is this found in 2 Corinthians, the next chapter, actually chapter 12, between verse 1 to verse 4. He said, I know of a man, whether in the body or in the spirit, I do not know, but he was taken up to the third heaven. So in, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul has such an experience yeah. So, in short, what I'm trying to tell us is that today, if you go on, on, on the social media, there are so many things yeah, that can be taught. Yeah? Yeah, let me just go through this. I will come to vision and revelation. But I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But God, he was caught up to paradise, heard inexpressible word, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Yeah, so Paul was such a man that he was brought up to the third heaven. Yeah. And how many heavens are there? According to Paul, there's three. According to Enoch, there's ten. Mm. <laughs> Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let me tell you something. There are mystery. Is it, the, is it three or is it ten? In the Bible, specifically, it's three. But if the book of Enoch is admit as one of the canon uh, uh, scripture. Then according to Enoch, there's 10. But let me tell you, all this, whether 3 or 10, does not affect our salvation. Whether 3 or 10, it is not in that sense as important as you know how to prepare yourself for the coming of the king. That means there are certain knowledge that is good to know, but it doesn't affect our standing with God. Does that make sense? That means whether there are 3 heaven or 10 heaven, it doesn't matter because the most important is are you preparing yourself, are we preparing ourselves, getting ready for the return of the king. Yeah? For how do we get ready? Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27. It says, Husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might what? Sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Ah, this is what you should prepare. That means whether there is 10 heaven, 7 heaven, 3rd heaven, Okay, it's good to know. I mean, if we really receive confirmation according to the book of Enoch that we have got 10 heaven, praise the Lord. That, that indeed is such an expanse of mystery in the kingdom of God. But whether we are presenting, preparing ourselves as a glorious church, that's more important. Because sometimes we get so caught up with all this supernatural that we got so hyped up, that we get so excited that we forget the simplicity of the gospel that's in Christ. Amen? That we forget the things that are important. That we forget there are things that, that God needs us to pay attention to. There are knowledge that is good to know, but it does not add to your preparation. But there are some knowledge that we, that we need to know that will affect our future in Christ. So the Bible says, 
husband love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That means Christ loved us so much that he gave himself for her. So that means God expects us to give ourselves to the church also. And then one of the things that he do is that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That means daily, the word of God is supposed to cleanse you and me. It's supposed to wash us clean. How do we become chaste virgin when we are daily cleansed by the word of God? That means this is far more important than whether discussing and checking whether there's three heaven or ten heaven. I mean, in your free time, it's good to go and learn. Yeah? In your free time, it's good to do some research. But like I say, whether there's third heaven, ten heaven, this is a separate matter. Because presenting yourself as a glorious church is a separate discipline altogether. Yeah, that means it's like if you if you know that there is a certain place in Singapore that serves very good food that nobody knows, good for you. But more importantly, is, is are you getting your promotion uh, next month? <laughs> are you doing a good job in your in where you are being called to? You know, so that means there are things that's good to know. But it does not affect, has very little bearing on the way it affects this preparation. That means we have to categorize knowledge that are good to know, and then there are knowledge sometimes that can be a distraction. God, there are some people who are so interested into the supernatural, you know, I mean, they get into the rabbit trail until eventually they lost their way out. Alamak, <laughs> how to get out? And then you are totally not interested in the basic thing. As the Bible said, the simplicity. That's in Christ. So that is very important because if we don't get this correct, you find we will find ourselves being distracted with all kinds of teachings, all kinds of emphasis. And you don't even know whether this is legit or not legit. So that's why it's important to have the reference in the scripture. So when people say they have been to the courts of heaven, I find there's no emphasis in the Bible. Except for this case where Paul says he's taken up to the third heaven. Right? He said that he did negotiation with Jesus. I also know five presidents in the Bible. That means when there is experience, there's no president in the scripture, we have to be very careful before we accept a spiritual truth. Does that make sense? That means if anything, there's an experience, but there's no president in the Bible, we just need to be mindful. Doesn't mean we everything we throw away. No, it just means we need to be mindful. Because experience can be very subjective. Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. He said, no wonder even Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. That means he can create experience and give you light, counterfeit light. And you receiving that light, you will be thinking that, hey, this is the real light. And you may be receiving, they are light and they are light. So light, I used to get, I, you know, I used to be very confounded by this John chapter 1 verse 9. John chapter 1 verse 9, Jesus, or rather John identified Jesus as the true light. Yeah, John chapter 1 verse 9, he said, I, he is the true light. So I was thinking, how come God true light and false light? Actually, there is. Yeah, he said, there it was, the true light, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light, which coming to the world enlightens everyone. That means they are true light. And then the other one that is also masqueraded by the angel of light. So he said, no wonder Satan masquerade himself. And why does he masquerade himself as the angel of light? Because so that he can also give you revelation. Did you hear that? That means the reason why Satan masquerades himself as the angel of light is to give you revelation. Is to enlighten you. In, incidentally, the name Lucifer means light bearer. So that means he... Before he fell, was a light bearer. That's why, that's why it is said that Lucifer may not be the strongest angel, but he's one of the brightest. That's why last week, if you remember, in Ezekiel 28 verse 17, we covered that last week. He says that, oh, no, no, no. In, I think it was, uh, was it, I think it's Ezekiel 28 verse 17. Let's try if my memory serves me correctly. He says that you are perfect in beauty, and you have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. According to that version I give you, is what ESV or Amplify, is it? Okay, hard to recall. Huh? Okay, we, you just hold it there. That means the reason that Lucifer was called Lucifer, the light bearer, is because he himself actually was himself a, a very bright angel. 
That means his wisdom was corrupted because of the reason of his brightness. Are we able to find the Ezekiel 28, 17? Yeah, any version doesn't matter. Because some versions say by, by reason of the splendor. Yeah, but some versions say by reason of your brightness. Yeah, and so because of your brightness, he said that you are lifted up because of your beauty and your corrupted wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So that word splendor in some versions say because of your brightness. That means it is said that Lucifer is not the most powerful angel, but he's certainly one of the brightest. That means he will deceive us to craftiness. Just the same way he deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden, they lost their authority because of what? Because of craftiness. That means God make it very simple. Eat this tree, don't eat that tree. That's it. Simple instruction. Eat this tree, don't eat this tree. Then what I said, when, when, when Lucifer come, what did he do? When, said, when the serpent come, he, oh, did he say that actually? Maybe Jesus said that, God said that because he doesn't want to be as wise as him. Maybe when you eat that, your eyes will be open and then you'll become like him. You see, he begins to complicate and make sophisticated argument. Oh, yes. The, the, the instruction was simple. Eat this tree. That's it. You know, this one, just, that's it. <laughs> Is it correct, Sebastian? <laughs> Just eat that one. Just take this one. The other three, don't take. That's it. But Lucy, the serpent came and he began to complicate. Oh, maybe, you know, so, so you see, I find actually, now that I've been through, you know, 30, 35 years of cycle, I realize that actually, God intend to keep the gospel simple. Trust me. I'm deeply convinced. This one, I'm very convinced. That means, the idea of the whole gospel is that everything in the whole testament, in the Old Testament, is summarized in this love God and love your neighbor. That's it. It's simple. Love God, love your neighbor. That's it. He said, a new commandment I give you. Later we'll cover that in 1 John. He said, a new commandment. This is a commandment. It's not new actually. You have that command in the Old Testament. But the summary of the whole thing of your Christian work, if you love God, love your neighbor. You say that, you mean out of our Christian work, this is the only thing we do? Sounds a bit like very restrictive and very limited. No. Because in the word, love God and love your neighbor, that covers a lot of topic. Love God, love your neighbor means you must be doing evangelism. Love God, love your neighbor means you've got to forgive your enemy. Love God, love your enemy. Love God, love your love, love God, love your neighbor means you cannot watch his unforgiveness. Love God means you will grow wise every day. The more you love God, the more you love the word of God. So the instruction is simple. But what covers is actually very deep, very high, very broad, very wide. This is the simplicity and instruction of God that seems simple. But actually, this simple instruction covers a lot of ground. Because when you say you love God, it means you stop living only for yourself. This itself is a big topic. Yes, the, when you say you love God, it means not only you. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but very few follow Him. Only those who really love Jesus will follow Him. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if you want to follow me, Ah, then this is what you must do if you want to follow me. That means Jesus is talking to his disciple in Matthew 16, 24. If you want to follow me, that means he's talking to believers. That means there is another level that you should go. You, for you have believed me. Then he said, now, now that you have believed me, now if you want to follow me. So you see, love God means if anyone who wants to come after me or follow me, that means actually it covers many things. The, the instruction sounds simple, but actually the amount of things that it cover is tremendous. That means it's as if God summarized all the different, different commandments and different, different instructions in just summarize and encapsulate into these two simple instructions. To love your neighbor means you care for him. If you see him hungry, you feed him. If you see your neighbor thirsty, you give him a drink. If you see your neighbor naked, you clothe him. It covers that. 
To love your neighbor means if your neighbor is broken hearted, you heal him. If your neighbor is, in, is lost, you are supposed to minister to him. If your neighbor is sick, you are supposed to impart healing. That means there are many things that actually encompass this seemingly very inconspicuous and very simple instruction. Love God and love your neighbor. Let me tell you, the wisdom of God has encapsulated everything. That means instead of telling you how to handle the enemy, how to deal with the devil, how you overcome. No, no, God do it very simple. Love God, love your enemy. If you have love, you cannot have hatred. Right? If you have love, you cannot be angry. If you have love, you cannot walk in pride. If you love, you cannot walk in unforgiveness. See, if, so actually, the, the instruction is simple. But when you walk in that, the amount of demons that is cast out of your life is tremendous. If you see the wisdom of God there, please say Amen. Okay, you're very economical, yeah, amen. One of the things is that, as I mentioned a couple of weeks, but anytime you hear something that is correct in the spirit, say amen, because you are also instructing your spirit to receive it. Amen? Yeah. So it says, so even though the instruction is simple, but it covers so much ground, that's why God wants to keep it simple. That's why it says, lest that Satan will corrupt your mind and corrupt, you know, that simplicity that's in Christ Jesus. That means the one thing that God eventually, ultimately, when He comes back, He's going to present us as a chaste virgin. That means every day, our job actually is to constantly allow the Word of God through the washing of the Word of God. Ephesians 5, 25, 27. It says that we may sanctify Him through the washing of the Word of God, that we may present Himself a glorious church. That means when Jesus comes back, how does a church become glorious? When they are sanctified by the Word of God. Because unless you're sanctified by the Word of God, it is impossible for you to walk in love. You only try not to kill your friend that you hate, that's all. Most of us don't really love it. just that I hate you, but I control myself because I'm a Christian, you know, so I cannot do bad things to you. No, no, no. God said, no, this is the Buddha teaching. Or this, is, this is the other kind of teaching. Yeah? Not, not, don't do to others what they don't want to do unto you. No, God saying, do unto others what you want to do unto you. Yeah, that means God is saying, don't do this, but I say, do this. God said, beyond just don't murder, God said, no, love. And when you love, every murderous thought will be taken away. So let me tell you, this simple instruction of love God, love your neighbor, it sounds so easy. Like, don't eat any tree, just this tree. Take this tree, that's it, simple instruction. And then Satan will come in, hey, you know, uh, I can bring you to the third heaven, you know. I can bring you, you can see, you know, talk to Elijah, have coffee with David, go swimming with Moses, you know, and have dinner with King, 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 uh, King uh, what do you call that, with uh, Elisha, you know, then have a chat also with Abraham, you know, visit his mansion, you know, have a house tour, you know. So we get so captivated by all these experience. Is this experience true? Really, I do not know. Only in the person know. But one thing I know, let me tell you something. Satan can create illusion also. You must remember when during the temptation in the book of Matthew, I think I can't remember between Matthew uh, verse 5 to verse 9, between these few verses, is it and he took him up to a high mountain and showed him the splendor of the world and the glory of the world. How did Jesus, how did Satan brought him up to a high mountain? They don't have leaf. There's no cable car. How did they go up? Secondly, when they go up to the mountain, how did he show? There's PowerPoint presentation, you know. Where's the mouse? Huh? Okay, can we have this slide? <laughs> no, there's no slide. There is immediately the technology. Let me tell you, their technology is far, far, far advanced than ours. We have to use mouse, computer, hook up cable, and then make sure there's right. No, there's straight away he show. Matthew 4, between verse 5 to verse, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I say again the devil turned into an exceedingly not Bukit Timah can heal. No, no, exceedingly high mountain. Not Bukit Timah. How, how many feet is Bukit Timah, uh, Joy? Two hundred feet, lah. Uh. Eh? Three hundred meter. Okay, we don't even call that. <laughs> Three hundred meter. Well, they're not the same. Yeah. So he bring up to exceedingly high mountain, and show him all the kingdom of the world. How did? Satan show his kingdom and his glory. That means he is able to produce a visual presentation. There is no reason that he bring him to a high mountain and then show him in words, alphabet, and this is the glory and the splendor. 
No need, you can just throw on earth. No need, go all the way to high mountain. That means he is able to churn out a visual, a visual of the things that, is, that you can see. That means Satan can create an illusion or rather a reality, like what we call today is a PowerPoint presentation. And I believe it's not in 2D. I think it's in 3D. Not 2D, you know. And in 3D, that means he can show him. That means if he can show Jesus this picture of the kingdom of the world and their glory, that means he can also create a third heaven for you to encounter. I absolutely believe so. I absolutely, because that's why he masquerade himself as an angel. Like, guys, by the way, when the Bible says he masquerade himself as an angel of light, that means he masquerade himself as an angel of enlightenment. That means he will show you revelation. Oh, this is where it gets dangerous. So that's why if you're not sharp, if you're not grounded in the Word, you, I can guarantee you, if today there is a conference in Singapore, they say there will be a conference talk about the explosion of love, you know, in a, a, a August a first to third, and then simultaneously in August first to third, there's the conference that talk about the ascending the supernatural and encountering and mobilize your personal angels for your life. You think which which conference will get more? <laughs> Right? I think the love probably attended by some aunties, like, you know, and go there. I'm in the seat. Nah. <laughs> right? And then the rest will go to the one that how do you mobilize your personal angels to fight for you? Oh, yes, because you don't you know why. Because naturally, we are being who are naturally interested in the supernatural. Because why? There is like an inner pull, the attraction that pull is almost like this is where we came from. And we are attracted to the supernatural. That's why we, we are inextricably and inexplainably attracted to the things that are occult. Right? When you talk about occult, oh, people want to dabble. Right? Anything that's spiritual, we, we, you know, we are very curious. They say curiosity kills a cat. I think it kills a lot of Christians as well. <laughs> Not only the cat. So we, because we by nature, we are spiritual. But just that now, it's not the time that our spiritual nature is fully expressed. When Jesus comes back, it will. But in the meantime, anything that's supernatural, it draws us, it attracts us, it pulls us. So, guys, that means today, stop disturbing me. Yeah? So, that means today, it is very difficult for us to discern what is real and what's not real if we are not careful. Because there are plethora of teaching that will come to counter offer to you what you can experience. As a believer. Amen. Let me, let me go to this. In John, in, in John chapter 1, we, let me go back to that verse in John 1 9. It says that in him he's the true light, right? It says in, in 4 5, in him was life, the light was the light of the, the man, and the light shines in darkness. And they said this, okay, this one is in him was life, power to bestow life, and the light was the light of man. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness do not understand, or I will overpower it, or appropriate, or absorb. That means you're not able to receive it. Today, you go to any corner and try to share the gospel with you about Jesus. There will be people who will react to you very violently. That's why today some Christians are so scared to share the gospel because we don't want to offend people. Wrong thinking. You're not offending them. You are trying to open their eyes from darkness. That's why. It takes courage. You see, we interpret in the nature. We say, oh, I don't want to be offensive to my friend. I don't want them to you know, get offended. No, you're not offending them. They are bound in darkness. We have the key to light. But strangely is that when, you see, the darkness not only do not understand, nor they have the capacity to appropriate, that means to receive or to absorb it. That means they will, they, they will bite you. When you want to share the gospel, they get very offended and most Christians get very frightened with this. As a result, we dare not to share the gospel. Let me tell you something. It is, uh, if you want to save, if you, if you work in SPCA, what does SPCA stand for? I mean, it's to keep those, you know, they go around to keep, what, find for all those dogs and animals, right? The cats, yeah? Don't know what, what, suddenly I forgot what does SPCA stand for. Society and protection of what? 
Ah, yes, thank you. The society and what of or something like that. Lah. Mm, okay, SPCA. Some husband need to go to this kind of shelter also. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if, if you are working at SPCA, you cannot work there if you're afraid to be beaten by dogs. Impossible. That means if you want to work in an organization like that and you're afraid to be beaten, you're not suitable because you will get beaten. There will be occasions where this very dog that you're saving, the very cat that you're saving, will turn around and bite you. Why? Because they're in fear. They think that you're coming to harm them. That's what people in the world respond to you. That's why sometimes they're very hostile to you. We should not be deterred by the hostility, but rather we should be motivated by the fact that they're in darkness. They can't see, but I have the light, I have the key. So the only way sometimes I have to talk to them is to have to directly present the good news to them. And if they bite, so be it. But today, we have this thing called political correctness, right? We have this thing called individual freedom. Don't violate, don't, don't threaten my freedom. I have the right to believe what I believe. So, we, we actually end up espousing and embracing all this worldly value that we want to be politically correct, that we dare not to share the gospel because it's offensive. I will be seen as intolerant. You might say that Jesus is the only way why he's so intolerant. Right? So, so, so I can tell you the system of the world has crept in that has immobilized the church today. But I'm of the conviction because we hold the keys, we are the light. And people who are in darkness and blind need our help. If we who has the answer are too scared to help, then there's no hope for them. This is the truth. But the, most Christians are so scared to get bitten, they, they all stay where they're not to approach that dog, you know, and that dog is dying. Even when the dog is drowning, they say, no, I better don't go and reach out in case, you know, he, he object for me helping him. We have become so frightened it's, it's, that we are all bound. Not only people that we're helping is bound. We, those we're supposed to help also, we are bound. We are bound by political correctness. We are bound by respect for, liber for liberty. We are bound by respect for individual freedom. We are bound by all this very powerful concept. But the truth is that many people are living in darkness. And you have the key. And you are the, you are the only one that have the key to light. Amen? Take a look at Matthew 4, 6. Matthew 4, 16, give us an idea of what's in the world. Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 16 talk about that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And those he said, who sat in the region of shadow of death, light has dawned. But people who are in darkness, we all too scared to show our light because in case the darkness get offended by our light. That's what Christians are saying today without you knowing what you mean. That means people who are in darkness, you are scared to bring the light in case they get offended, in case they get upset and say, why you give me the light? I never asked for it. You see how Satan has plan the world in such a way that the ground become very hostile and they psychologically and sociologically condition you to keep the good news to yourself in case you offend your friend. Wow. That's why he said you need to be as wise as a serpent but as innocent as a dove. So far in my experience sharing the gospel with people, I get beaten very rarely get beaten. Rarely because we must be wise as a serpent because when you know how to approach the gospel and you share the truth in love people don't usually bite you they may gently courteously say no once in a while you get maybe a guy like a rabbit dog but generally by and large people don't get offended in fact most of the time you'll be surprised they'll be receiving the gospel in tears amen so they say these are the people this is the condition people are sitting in darkness but there's a great light that's coming but the church is too scared to bring the light because you're scared to get rejected. And those who are set in the region of the shadow of death, light has come. You are the light. But the region of the shadow of death will remain the shadow of death. If every Christian keep their light at home. And this is what is happening, unfortunately, in the church. Amen. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 11, verse 34. Luke chapter 11, verse 34 to 35. I think we are asked for the amplified version, yeah? He said, the, light, the eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is clear, that means spiritually perceptive, focus on God, 
your whole body is full of light, benefiting from God's precept. But when it is bad, that means you're spiritually blind, your body is full of darkness, devoid of God's word. Be careful, therefore, that, that the light that the light that's in you is not darkness. So busy, uh, Sarah. <laughs> that the light in you is not darkness. Yeah? That means that means there's some light that can come across as darkness. That means there's sometimes there's certain light that angels that describe that this, that Lucifer that masquerade inside as light, sometimes it is darkness. So that means we're living in a world where if we do not know, we are not familiar with scripture, if we do not know the truth, we will fall into all kinds of teaching. Secondly, not only you fall into all kinds of teaching, you will not get yourself ready that we, the way that we should for the return of the king. That means when Jesus comes back, there are certain simple qualities he's looking for. Very, very straightforward, simple quality. But if you get complicated and you begin to go into all kinds of spiritual calisthenics, you'll be so distracted. That means originally you're supposed to go lavender, you end up in Changi. So far away. You know, you get, you know, you, 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 people give you a leave and give you a leave. Like, I can give you a right, I can give you a right. Then you say, okay, free right. You, the, the longer you take, the, the further you go away. You end up in Changi because of the free right. So you need to be spiritual. That's what the Bible says. Be vigilant. Be alert. Because the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. So he is looking for those who can be taken away. Yeah? So that means the eye is very important. That means if you have truth, if your eye has got revelation, your body will be full of light. That means actually who you are is determined by what your eyes see. That means if your eyes is blind, that's why you walk in darkness. Does that make sense? This is a spiritual truth. That means how, how clean you are in your life, how good you are as a person, how righteous and holy, how gentle, how, how, how a loving person and forgiving person you are depends on what your eyes see. If your eyes cannot see light, that means if there's no understanding and revelation, you will always say, how dark then is that your body is full of darkness. That's why people's life become dark. That's why people do bad things. That's why people do evil things. That's why they make wrong decisions. Take wrong decisions. Why? Because the eyes, there's no light coming from the eye. Because the eye is the lamb of the body. That means if your eyes is perceptive, if your eyes is enlightened, your whole body is enlightened. That means what does that mean? That means your life will be a life of fruitfulness. You don't walk in fear. You don't walk in craftiness. You don't walk in unrighteousness. You don't walk in greed. You don't walk in all the wrong things. But rather, you walk in freedom. You walk in love. You walk in power. You walk in, you know, there's no... That means anything that's associated with darkness, you're free from it. Let me tell you, this is a fantastic... This is a very precious commodity. That means at night, you don't need medication to make you fall asleep. That's what it meant. That means in the whole life, you never have to struggle with dark thoughts. That means the whole life you don't have to struggle with depression. That means the whole life you don't have to struggle with evil and good, choosing which one, you know, constantly having to struggle, choosing between good and bad. No, you, you walk in freedom. The eyes is very important. That means what your eyes see depends on your level of comprehension and revelation. I am convinced, as I said this many times, that revelation is meant for us daily. I used to think revelation should be something that happened once in a while. Today, I'm convinced that every day when we read scripture, we should have revelation. Because it is revelation that opens our eyes. It is revelation that enables our eyes to be open. It is revelation that enables that when your eyes is clear, that means spiritually receptive, focus on God, that your whole body is full of light. Guys, what does it mean when your body is full of light? That means you walk your life in power, in love. In grace, in joy, in peace. This is what happened. It's a precious life. Today, many people live tormented life. Behind closed door, there are many people who are struggling with darkness. Right? Vicious thoughts. Thoughts that are bad. Thoughts that, you know, they are harmful. All kind of thoughts that torment you. Why? Because your eye is bad. And your eyes is bad because why you've been living in darkness. That's why the, the path of the righteous is like what? The dawn of light. That means when light comes into your life, guys, that means it gets increasingly more and more. 
Proverbs 4.18. Yeah, in case you're looking for. That means the path of the righteous. That means every righteous man. So that means, the good thing is this. That means we have to stop with all this kindergarten measurement of what is a good Christian. In the past, for, for more than good 20, 30, 40 years, good Christian means every week go to church. Good Christian means just go to church regularly, attend Bible study, go pray meeting. That's a good Christian. We should throw all this away as soon as possible. We should actually be determined by the level of light that's operating our life. Amen? That means you determine by the amount of revelation and wisdom that we are receiving. That means the power of the just or righteous is like the shining sun. Okay, this one, not the best. Is it? But the power of the, of the righteous is at the dawn of light, the Bible says in some version. Is it? And then it shines brighter and brighter until the perfect day. That means if this is your path, that means you will live, a, your life is a life of freedom, your life is a life of joy. Your life is a life of love. That means you are a blessing wherever you go. Some people, it's a blessing wherever they go. <laughs> when they leave the place, this place becomes a blessing. <laughs> right? But we don't be this kind of people. We should be a blessing wherever we are, not wherever we go. Yeah? And this is, a, this is the life that is fruitful. This is a life that is this just like Jesus. That means when you have this life, you are living in the image and the likeness of your Father. Not only we are created in God's image, now you are walking the life that you are supposed to walk. Amen? I tell you, this is the life of freedom, guys. I, I talk to many people in my whole life, and I can tell you, many people are living in torment, they are living in, you know, in prison, they are like a slave being changed. This is not the abundant life. But I believe that we have full access to the abundant life. That means the abundant life is accessible with the right knowledge. Amen? That means the more you grow in the right knowledge, the eyes get brighter. When your eyes get brighter, your body is full of light. But when your body is full of light, that means you live a life of freedom, of joy. That means for ladies, you, God will set you free from jealousy. Yeah. When women get jealous... Hell have no no fury, right? <laughs> right? When 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 we are all bound by all this rough rage, the 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 nature of the serpent. You see, listen to this, yeah. That means in short, what Satan is trying to do is to let his character manifest in your life. That's all Satan tried to do is to let His likeness and His image manifest in your life. So every time when you harbor unforgiveness, you are behaving just like Satan. Every time when you get vicious and vindictive, you are behaving exactly like Satan. When you get selfish, you are behaving exactly like Him. Yep. So that means I can be a preacher, I can be a pastor, and today I can harbor deep unforgiveness. I can have a deep rage. That means I conceal my rage. That means I'm actually a very angry person. But you can't see it because I conceal it very well. So that means on a day I live like a pastor, behind closed door, I'm exactly like the enemy. And may God set us all free from this. Amen? So that means at the end of the day, let's go back once again to, to, to uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3. So that means that less I'm jealous with you with a godly jealousy. Why? Because God said that I may present to you as a chaste virgin. Right? To chaste virgin means you're pure in character. That means you are exactly like Christ. Amen. That somehow, that say less somehow the serpent deceive you by craftiness, that your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. That means in Christ. It's very simple. Let me round it up very quickly. It's almost 45 already. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. We'll go by the various verses I passed to you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. Now listen to this carefully. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandment is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. That means... The way that God is perfected in us is not by us serving ministry, go to mission, and no. The way God, Jesus is perfected in us is when what? When we, the love of God is perfected in us. Yeah. But by this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. Then the next seven to eight. 
He said, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but the old commandment which, have, which you have had from the beginning, from the beginning, right? The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. You, and you'll find that every now and then Jesus will talk about true light. That means they are light, they are not true. They are false light. Because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. That means he's an angel of enlightenment. He's an angel of revelation. Yeah. Verse 9 to 10. Listen to this. He who say he's in the light and hate his brother is in darkness until now. Wow. It's so simple, right? If you say you're in light, and you hate your brother, slash sister, slash brother, slash uncle, slash mother, slash father, yeah? All this, anybody you can fill up. is in darkness until he who loves his brother abides in the light. There is no cause for stumbling in him, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, in short, guys, you can be taken up to the third heaven, even to the seventh heaven, and hate your brother. This experience is useless. Today, even you can prophesy prophetically. That means you're very sharp in the prophetic gift. You, when you say something, wow, you know, you can literally, your gift, or in fact, we always mis in fact, we always mistaken word of knowledge for word of prophecy. Most of the time, people operate in word of knowledge, not word of prophecy. Prophecy is different. Prophecy is talking about the future. What about knowledge? Knowing something. Like for example, I said, oh, in the past you've done this, or currently you're doing this. This is word of knowledge, not prophetic gift. Can we quickly just do a quick jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9? I do a quick, quick diversion. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. So that we have a good idea what we always term as prophetic gift is actually not prophetic gift, it's just a word of knowledge. Yeah, there is the gift in the spirit. It says to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. This is the number one gift. Two, to another word of knowledge. Two, three, to the same spirit, another faith by the same spirit, to another gift of healing by the same spirit. And verse 10, what does it say? Yeah, nine gifts altogether, nine gifts of the spirit. Then to some miracles, right? And then healing, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. to another working of miracle, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirit, to another different kind of tongue, to another interpretation, nine gifts altogether. So most of the time, what is actually the word of knowledge, the gift of the word of knowledge, we always say prophetic gift. No, prophetic gift is this. This is prophetic gift. In, 20, in, two, in, in 18 months' time, Singapore economy is going to collapse. That's a prophetic gift. In six months' time, there will be earthquake hitting Singapore. That's prophetic gift. But if you say, oh, I see that you ever forgive your mother, that's not prophetic. It too become prophetic. Right? Oh, I see that you know, you're still upset the dog that died three years ago. Okay, that's not prophetic. That's just word of knowledge. So we like to mix everything seemingly all, all prophetic gift. That's why I try to speak louder so that we can out. Out. <laughs> I'll do the music, yeah. So don't get mistaken. We always mix this word of knowledge. And by the way, the first number one gift of the spirit is the word of wisdom. Wisdom is number one, incidentally. Yeah. So very quickly back to first John chapter uh chapter two, verse seven to nine to eleven. So he who say, I know him, and yet hate his brother, he say that he is in darkness, walks in darkness. That means, if we walk in darkness, guys, that means you're not ready when Jesus comes back. So it really has got no value if there's three heavens, seven heavens, ten heavens. No, no value. Even if you go to heaven, have coffee with Jesus, you know, dinner with Moses, lunchtime with Abraham, no use. You still walk in darkness. So in short, we need to differentiate experience while it is valuable. But let's not spend our time chasing experience. Amen? But rather we should chase our time walking in truth and grace. This is more important. Now let's say a man who has never been to the third heaven but constantly walking in love. 
this man is ready for the return of the king. That is spiritual wisdom. Is it? There's a simplicity that's in Christ, lest that the devil come and corrupt you from the simplicity that's in Christ. That means the simplicity in Christ is walk in love. I said it's so simple, it's scary. That's all to it, uh, but there is dimension to this truth. That means when you walk in love, you are prepared to forsake yourself. You are, when you walk in love, you are prepared to take up the cross and deny yourself. When you, walk, when you walk in love, it means you are ready to forgive the person who has pained you and hurt you very badly three years ago or 20 years ago until today you still remember. When you walk in love, it means when somebody is sick, somebody is sick, somebody is pained, somebody is hungry, you, this is your business. You become your brother's keeper. Not, it's not my problem. <laughs> I mean, I cannot be looking after everybody. You know, the church has got a tremendous talent for turning a blind eye to people who are hungry. So, though the instruction is simple, but let me tell you, this instruction covers the whole gamut of the Bible. It's so scary. Think about this. The instruction sounds simple, but it covers many things. That means there's no room for darkness. To be in darkness means a lot. That means you're in ignorance. You're bound by the enemy. You're in change. So that's why Lucifer can't masquerade as an angel of light. He's not the strongest but he's one of the brightest. Can we go to Jude chapter 1, verse 6? Sorry, I didn't give this to you. You see, Lucifer is not the strongest of angels. Yeah? But Jude 1 says that there are angels that are bound in change. There are, there are those whom the Lord who did not abide their own abode, who do not abide in their own territory, but left their abode. That means these are the angels that rebel. These are the watchers that rebel in Genesis chapter 6. And they came and then they left their original abode. No, one six, not one twelve. Twelve is six times two. Just six times six only, no six times two. Yeah. Just do one six talk about those angels that are being bound by change, right? Who do not keep their proper domain but left their own abode. That means these are angels who are supposed to be having their, their space in the realm of the spirit. But when they saw the, the daughters of men, they got so tempted. That they came and then they intermarry with the daughters of men. And as a result, you have the Nephilims, the demigod that's produced. He said, This they reserve in everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I was recently listening to one particular testimony. This man said that he went to this place where these angels were kept. He said he went to this compartment in hell. Now, whether that is legit or no, I leave it to him. But what, one of the things he says this, he said, he said, I didn't see that angel. But he said, I believe this was this angel that I encountered. He said, the car changed. The way the change moved, it's not the change that you see in the prison. You know, those car change they use for ship anchor. You know, those big ship, the anchor, that one time you let go the anchor, the mouth, the change, like one feet thick type of change. He said, you can feel that's the car change that's chaining these kind of angels. So he said, Lucifer is not the strongest angel, but he's the brightest. That means he come as a manger of light. That's why unless we have the true light, you cannot fight Lucifer. You are no match. I don't care how many angels you bind here, bind here, bind this, bind that. It's useless. <laughs> because you're still bind by the, by the lies. <laughs> the easiest level of, deliver, of, of spiritual battle is binding the devil. So called casting out. Trust me, this is the easiest. The toughest one is to counteract, to, to detect the counterfeit truth. Because he's specialized in that. He's the angel of light. That means he comes and he disguises himself as a revelation, as, 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 as enlightenment, as knowledge and understanding. So if you do not know the word, I tell you, you will buy into all kinds of truth. Today, in, let me close in this. We are just four minutes away, six minutes away. Today, in the world we are living in, there is really... It's like a buffet, a smogas book of all the different preaching and teaching. And if we're not careful, we will get trapped and we will get lured by many teaching. That's what I call spiritually very seductive. Or to use a financial term, it's a very sexy message. When I was in the life insurance industry, they always say, oh, this investment is very sexy. It's not the plain vanilla investment. It's a very sexy investment tool, you know. So we are sometimes seduced by messages that are seductively, spiritually seductive. That means it triggers your, our innate desire to get into spiritual stuff. 
We are all spiritual by nature. That's why spiritual things intrigue us. Today, if you walk past people who are, who, who, who are spiritually, uh, you see spiritual manifestation, you, you'll be very triggered. If today we walk out the door, see somebody levitating, I tell you instantly there's a crowd. Right? Because we, by nature, we are inquisitive. We are connecting to the roots and our future. But we need, in the meantime, to focus on what it is important in our time on earth. That means your time on earth, don't worry, don't make going to heaven as your priority. There is a place for that. We will all get there one day. If the Lord gives our sister uh, experience or Sarah an opportunity to go to heaven tonight, praise the Lord, she come back, she can encourage us to tell us, hey, indeed, heaven is beautiful. And we can be encouraged by that. But while there is an experience in the meantime, what are you doing for yourself right now? How are we preparing ourselves as the bride for Christ? How are we preparing ourselves? Let me quickly, we've got four more minutes, just now or six minutes. Um, Revelation chapter 2. Verse 2 to 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 5. We talk about the church in uh, Ephesus. Yeah, the church in Ephesus, the Lord told the church in Ephesus, I know your work, I know your labor, your patience, you cannot bear those who are evil. That means this church is pretty productive. He has got many works, he has got a lot of patience, a lot of all those things, but he tested those who are apostles and have not found that liar. That means they are very sharp also. They are able to discern who are the real apostles, the false apostles, and you have labor for my name's sake and not become what you see. That means this church is a very productive church. Yeah, when this is a church that is today, when we see a church like that, we will be, it's, a, it's a bustling church. But what does it say in 4 to 5? I said, but nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have what? Left your first love. That means Jesus is no longer your first love. Maybe the, the gift has become your first love. Prophetic, I, I tell you people, some people are so obsessed with prophetic, they live, breathe, eat, and sleep prophetic. Now, nothing wrong with that. I think if sometimes this is the call you have, God, God will give you the desire, but don't let it replace Jesus. Any gift, anything that you operate, replace Jesus, no longer a gift. It becomes an idol. Yes, it's red thin. Yes, therefore, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work. That means love. Those who don't love still walk in darkness. So you can see, we can be very busy in the church, but all God is saying that while you're doing all this work, Make sure you don't walk in darkness, walk in love. And I can tell you, it's easy to do ministry than to love. Based on my limited experience as a pastor. Ministry is easy. If today, right, you're called, let's say, you know, Ivan is called to do a teaching session or, or Brad Yongping is called to do a teaching session, it's very easy. You can teach without, you know, without loving people, just have knowledge. Right? But when I say, go and do disciple with this individual, Walk with him and disciple him. Now that's different. <laughs> that means you've got to love the person. That means he will go, he will irritate you. He, he will do things that will trigger you. He will do things that will get you turned off. He will do things that will discourage you and yet you still need to love the person. He will bite you and you still have to let them bite and still feed them. This is where love gets difficult. So unless you possess the love and the grace of Christ, you will not be able to. Impossible. You, you, you want to kill the dog. Society for prevention, not prevention. Society for expediting cruelty. <laughs> S-E-C-A. <laughs> you, know I mean? you, you, you want to kill the person you look after. Let me tell you, the most challenging as a pastor really is to love people. Is to love people. Uh, it's easy to love people who are lovable. Uh. Those who are not so lovable, shall I mention him? No, I shouldn't. <laughs> are they unlovable people? I won't mention them. <laughs> are they unlovable? Okay, I won't say unlovable, but people are in darkness. You see, this requires wisdom. When you think they're unlovable, you think you need a lot of love. But when you understand that they're in darkness, that means you need a lot of patience. That's why perseverance. Right? James, uh, first... I think, sorry, can I do the last, last verse? One more minute. First Peter chapter 2, uh, no, First Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 5, 6, and 7. Yeah, verse 5. Okay, guys, this one, last instruction, okay? Listen to this. This is your track to grow in love. But to grow in love, God starts with what? Faith first. 
It is not faith. Start with what first? Let me see. Uh, first Peter chapter. Oh, sorry, no, no, sorry. Bam, 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 bam. Second Peter. I sorry. Second Peter chapter one verse five to seven. Second Peter chapter one verse five to seven. This is a road meant to walk in love. So for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. Self-control, perseverance. Perseverance, godliness. To godliness, to brotherly kindness. From brotherly kindness, to love. Is everything culminates in love. That means love is the apex of full manifestation. That when you say you're perfect, actually you're not perfect without sin. A person can be perfect without sinning, but they have no love. <laughs> that means you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do pornography, you don't do anything, but still no love. So the church has been using the wrong measurement. The right measurement is love. That's why love, faith and hope. The greatest is love. So if you don't love, you remain in darkness. A very, very serious statement. That means it's so simple. This is the main thing that adds value. That means this is what gives you value spiritually. That means when you walk in love. And these guys take years to cultivate. I know, I'm a pastor. You think I, I already perfect in love? A long way there. <laughs> Send me an irritating guy, I'll, I'll trigger anytime. <laughs> Absolutely, I repent, okay? But I'm growing, I'm learning. Give me time, I give you time, you give me time, amen? That's why we give each other's time to grow in love. But I can tell you something. When you grow in love, you become a super massive nuclear power. That's one thing I know. Because every, because when you love every individual that society write off, you see potential. That means there are potential that can only be detected by love. Because when you don't love a person, you don't see potential. All you see is massive irritation. All you see is all their weakness. All you see is their hopelessness. All you see is you want to get away from them. Absolutely. Some of us are like that. Some of us meet people like that. At one point, we are also like that. <laughs> right? You think, you think other people is difficult to love with? You see yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We always think, difficult people always think about other people, right? We say difficult people always think about other people, not think about ourselves. Yeah? Let me tell you, sometimes you are one of the most difficult person to love. We ourselves. At one point, I, I was also a very difficult person to love. Maybe it's still, for some people, I'm still a very difficult person to love. Yes. Absolutely. So the point is this, guys. Let me wrap it up quickly. So Satan will emasculate himself as an angel of light to, cons- uh, to deceive the body of Christ with all kinds of revelation and enlightenment. He is, in that sense, the angel of enlightenment because he, encou- he emasculates himself as an angel of light. It means he emasculates himself as an angel of enlightenment and revelation. That means unless you know the word of God, you want to know, know what revelation is real, what revelation is not real. That's why it's very important to read the word of God. That's why even the simple instruction given, did God say you cannot eat? They're really confused already. Just one instruction. Just one instruction. Under questioning, they go, they lose it. Well, actually, he said, not only cannot, he cannot touch also. Well, you know, he add on an additional commandment. And then whatever the case, they end up losing everything they have. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes because your eye is the lamp to your body. If your eyes is full of light, your body is full of light. That means you're walking in perfection, you're walking in love, you're walking in righteousness. But if your body is full of darkness, going to church eight times a week also won't help you. It is the amount of light that comes in. Amen. Let's stand.